Here's the progress that's been made to date. So 2004, when we started, the only native plants there were a couple of scruffy horakiki on the peat lake shore uh, and a couple of manuka, a whole band of willow, which has subsequently been removed. And by 2016, the figure it was up to 31 hectares of new habitat being created. And now in 2018, it's well over 35 hectares. So how did we do all of this? We did this by working with the council, but we largely did it by voluntary community activity. And the photograph here shows what happens on an Arbor Day at Waifakariki. So June 2016, Arbor Day planting, 1,800 people, 28,000 plants, three hectares in three hours. That's how we've been putting it together. Now, of course, it does take a bit longer than that, because notice all of the plants lying on the ground there. Who laid all of those out over the previous two days to make sure they were in the right place so that they would be planted appropriately? So there is a lot of prep goes into it. It's a military operation. But every Arbor Day, this is what we do. And of course, over the period from 2004 to 2018, there's been an enormous amount of learning about the appropriate way to plant native plants. So in the first year, when the council staff wandered back to check the plantings, I think over 20% of them still had their plastic bag on them. <laughs> 2018, when the check was done, it was less than 1% needed to be replanted. So there's been a huge community learning, and of course there's been that social cohesion built as a person who planted the plant in 2014, and it might have been at secondary school then, is now a parent who's taking their children along and teaching their children how to do this properly. This is the importance of urban ecology. So I'm, I'm afraid that I'm now going to get into the hard part of my talk, because I do need to point out that up until now I've been giving you a whole lot of ideas and. I guess you might say visionary statements. The question still is, what is it based on? Well, it's actually based on a whole lot of research. I'm not just making it up. Ken, I'm not. <laughs> and I just wanted to quickly flick through some of the examples of the research that we've done to underpin this process. So the list here is the sort of research, I'm not going to read through it all, that myself and my urban ecology team have been doing for about the last 15 years to help make sure we do the stuff right. So I'm just going to briefly comment on each slide and I don't expect you to take in all of the detail. What we've found, of course, is that in restoration planting in our city, there is a tendency to use a very small subset of the flora that we should be using if we are serious about habitat reconstruction. So the figures for Hamilton Ecological District, 343 vascular species in our di ecological district, within our city only 195 species are present. That shows you the shortfall. And within that 195 species, people mostly use up to 11 to 15 species of a system that should have in it 343 species. We also know that the, the species, and this, this sort of illustrates it further, is that we have interesting gaps in what is being used. You know, the focus is always on the things that form the canopy. What about all of the things that should be in the understory? What about all of the things that should eventually be in the ground cover? And this research simply demonstrates that we are doing more poorly with understory species than we are with canopy species. In order to have a persistent ecosystem, we need to build the diversity to get the resilience. This graph simply gives me the comfort of knowing that actually when we do the planting, these are three, era, three different age classes of planting, yes, the answer is native species richness increases. I would have been in real trouble if we hadn't have got that answer. Also, when you're working in a place like Waifakariki, you can demonstrate to the people who are funding you 
that you are removing the weeds. So here is what happens when you get canopy closure in a forest and all of those pasture grasses and pasture weeds disappear. The, the downward trending curve is the way those species are lost between the years of 2008 and 2016 because we have a network, a permanent network of monitoring plots to track our success in the habitat reconstruction. The graph on the right simply, simply shows that the longer you're there, the more the native plant regeneration increases. And how does it increase? Because your plants mature, they start to flower, they start to fruit, they drop their seed, their propagules, and progressively you get native plants regenerating on the site that you did not plant. But the big challenge that remains is to do with things that most people never notice or ne never see. This diagram is just a flash way of saying that when you do your PB3 planting, uh, what you don't know about is what's in the seed bank and what's in the seed rain. So that what you're trying to do when you're doing habitat reconstruction is not only put plants in the ground, you're trying to get the ecosystem to move in a direction where increasingly the seed bank and the seed rain is dominated by native species and not by exotic, particularly weedy problem plants. This research shows that in the same way that predation is a problem for our native birds, Regeneration is compromised by those same predators that eat, they munch, they destroy the seed that is being produced from the plants that you plant. So pest control has the double benefit of protecting the native birds, but also assisting the process of regeneration. When we did this research, we caged seeds and left other, other seeds uncaged to see what the survival rate was. And this graph simply shows that when you cage them, you actually, they will stay there because they're not destroyed by the predator. But when they do not have that protection, the rats and the mice and the possums and all the rest chew at them and essentially destroy them, thereby present, uh, preventing regeneration. Now, of course, I'm looking at this data now and thinking predator-free New Zealand 2050 perhaps your experiment was before its time, if we could get the result of predator-free 2050, what will it do for the regeneration of our native flora? Environmental drivers, we've done a whole lot of hardcore work there to try and understand what is the threshold point at which you start to gain control of your site. Now this complex looking mathematical model merely shows you there's a circle up there on the left at 20 years. And what it says is once you have canopy closure, you control the fluctuation in temperatures in the soil and within the patch of habitat, you suddenly get a burst of regeneration. So 20 years in, you will, it could take you 20 years of work before you really start seeing the results. I guess the message in this is, if you're going to create habitat, you need to be in it for the intergenerational game. It's not just about what you do as a volunteer today, but what is going to come after you. Who's going to be the succession plan for the young people who join your group and continue the project on into the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? This model was a way of testing what is the appropriate time and what is the survival rate for what we call enrichment planting? That's when you go back into your site 12 or 15 years later and you pop some additional species in because your pioneer species are declining and in fact dying. And the message from this one was, yes, by the time you get to age 12 or 15, that is the time to add the things to the understory and the caveat on that is, please make sure you do not plant monodominant stands of species like manuka, because they will slow the process of regeneration of other species down. 
And then the perennial question that many volunteer groups have asked us, what do I do about the Tradescantia? Do I need to completely remove it? What should I do to overcome that invasive, all-encompassing mat of Tradescantia in the habitat? Well, this, one, this graph is merely there to show a simple result. If you plant your understory species at a height of at least one metre, they will survive, they will grow, and they will progressively make life more difficult for the Tradescantia. But if you go in there with short plants, less than a metre high, and plant them into a Tradescantia mat, they will be overwhelmed. They will be covered up and overwhelmed. And the further north you go in New Zealand, the higher the plant is that you have to plant. If you go to Northland, the threshold there is about 1.5 metres because Tradescantia is even more vigorous in Northland than it is in Hamilton where I live. Of course, there are new things on the horizon now that are helping in this process. Have you guys got the beetle yet? Have you got the beetle in Tauranga? Yeah, you've got the three species of beetle that start to defoliate the Tradescantia. That can give you that little edge which will allow some of the native species to regenerate. And the last experiment that I wanted to show was, again, we were trying to think of ways to beat the predator. And this data simply showed that if you put a clay ball around a seed like Tawa or some of the others, then you would get a 25% survival rate just because you put it in a clay ball. Again, I'm thinking this experiment is now out of date because with predator-free 2050 on the horizon, we shouldn't need the clay ball either. Last experiment, just before we get to the, the um, softer part of the talk, if you like. Um, we've also been experimenting with reintroducing some of the really specialist plants in the habitat. And these are the, the shrub epiphytes that grow up in the big trees. New Zealand is remarkable because it has a guild, a collection of small shrubs which are adapted to more or less entirely growing perching way up in the canopy of other plants. And there are some, just some pictures there on the left of Tafarikaro, the Petosporum cornifolium, and the one on the right, Grizzlinia lucida. These had been almost entirely lost from the small patches in Hamilton City because the possums had eaten them all out. Once we got control of the possums, we can then think about bringing them back into the system. And that's what we've done. So we've run a trial and demonstrated that over a six year period we can get 85% survival of uh, shrub epiphytes that we've brought back into the habitat. Now of course it's not just about constructing, reconstructing the habitat, it is also about pest control. And this is the scale of the pest control that's been going on in Hamilton City. So for a start, there's a lot of pest control going on within the reserves within the city, but as well, in a 15 kilometre radius around the city, there's been intensive pest control in those large chunks of forest marked in red there on the diagram. You can see the grid there in the middle, Hamilton City, and you can see the red bits out around either near to or just beyond the 15 kilometre radius. There's been intensive pest control going on there, but pulsed pest control, like every four to six years. And as a result, in Hamilton City, when I moved there in uh, 1992, and from the period 1992 up until the period 2009 approximately, in my gully, my, Bev in my gully, we saw one tui over a period of 30 minutes. The combination of habitat reconstruction and pest control has led in Hamilton City to what we call the Tui tipping point. We got to the point where Tui's went from reported sightings in 2007 of 11, 28 in 2008, and by 2009, 490 sightings, and already starting to nest in the year 2007, and by this time uh, 2009 had come, the Facebook site that the Regional Council had set up for people to record their TUI sightings had to be 
decommissioned because people were sick and tired of reporting to ease. So the bigger picture in Hamilton, and it applies here in Tauranga too, of course, is that as well as working within the city, we've been thinking about ways to link the city to the peri-urban zone. Natural corridors are provided by our Hamilton gullies because they have tributaries that extend way beyond the boundary of the city and come into the city. So natural corridors are being produced from the habitat um, reconstruction caused by riparian planting. But as well as those, this is what's happening over our way at the moment. So all of those new expressways, all of the new motorways that are being built, we are looking at those as an opportunity to further connect and link habitat from one place to another. And that's ex essentially what those images are trying to sow. At every opportunity, look for opportunities for reconnection of indigenous habitat. Now we know that when we get to this point, when we can actually turn around in our city, once we've built the predator-proof fence at Waifakariki and got these birds back, we're probably in the state that we need to be. We're still at least 15 to 20 years away from that. We're building the habitat first at Waifakariki. When we've got 55 of the 60 hectares planted up, then we'll consider putting the fence around and then we'll be starting to think about can we bring the birds back above and beyond the ubiquitous tui and the occasional visiting bellbird and the single pair of keraroo that we currently have in one reserve. Now I'm not saying that what's happened in Hamilton City is exactly um, able to be translated across other urban environments in New Zealand, but I think it gives plenty of clues about what can be done to help places that have de depleted their biodiversity to less than 10%. In Hamilton, our solution has been to work on the gullies. If we worked on all of those, if we restored or reconstructed in all of them, we'd get 8.6% of habitat back. And if we just kept working away at our little patches, if we put all of this together, we would quite easily just go past New Plymouth's 8.9%. And of course, that's the way we're framing it with the community. We're encouraging the community, our target is to beat New Plymouth, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, people in New Plymouth know that now. <laughs> and they are now working at their next target, which is closer to 15% through some of the projects going on down there at the moment. You may have heard of Project Maunga and all of the money that's just been dropped into New Plymouth to get rid of predators. So. Um, I guess what I'm saying though is that we need to systematically think about the current scenario here in Tauranga and see what could be done here in Tauranga. The constraints that we'll have to overcome are many. Uh, this is a list of them. Um, but I'm not going to go through every single one of them because actually I've really covered those off already. There are numerous constraints, but I tend to focus on the opportunities because I'm an optimist. And here are some of the key opportunities presented by restoration in urban environments. Probably above all, the potential for intensive human intervention. The very thing that was the Achilles heel of removing the flora and fauna can be turned into the major benefit. The lack of grazing animals, in urban environments. There's a massive advantage when you're trying to reconstruct a forest. And of course some of those predators are nowhere near as common in the urban environment as they are in the peri-urban zone or the rural zone. Uh, and it's also the place where all of the resources are concentrated. So, you know, coordinated interagency action and a convergence of disciplines and capability can all be brought to bear on restoring an urban environment. But when you do it, you'll get more than just the biodiversity. Although you may be focusing on the flora and fauna, you get all of the other benefits of doing this sort of work. You know, this habitat, when it's reconstructed, is filtering our air and our water. It's providing a cooling buffering on, you know, heat islands within urban environments. It's providing opportunities for other activity 
Recreation is the one that comes to mind above everything else. You know, all of those walkways and cycleways that go through places that also have enormously important values for our flora and fauna. And, you know, in the face of climate change, every tree you plant will sequester carbon and help us meet the Paris target. And we've got a fair way to go. Even if we got the billion trees, will we make that target? But also, the health and recreation benefits, first of all, of getting out there and, the, you know, getting out and doing something out in the, in the um, park or the garden where you're working, uh, you know, the cycleways, the walkways, all of these things have enormous health and recreation benefits, which are actually preventative medicine as opposed to waiting till you get crooked because you're not doing enough physical activity. <coughs> Above all though, I think the importance of urban ecology is around reconnecting children with nature. Because there's one thing that's happened in society in New Zealand is that over the last couple of generations or so, you know, we all had that direct connection to the rural zone, you know, all the kids were sent off to the uncles and aunties on the farm for their holiday, but you know now 80% of us have little or no connection to that environment and that means we have a generation of young people coming through whose only understanding of nature is what they see on a screen, right? As opposed to getting out there and learning about it in the real world. A well-informed public is actually one of the most important applications of urban ecology. So when I started this talk, I'm sure you realised I wasn't going to say urban restoration. No, it's not the new frontier. I was never going to say that, was I? I sincerely believe that it is the new frontier. It's taking us beyond that stage of mainland, island restoration, and we're moving into a new environment, a new opportunity presented by urban restoration. And what we've been doing at the University of Waikato is trying to build this into our research programs. And the results that I've reported to you here tonight come from our Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment funded research program, People, Cities and Nature. I don't have time to tell you all about the content of the work going on in there, but I, I've been focusing on one element of it and one element alone. I've been essentially focusing on the habitat reconstruction using plants. There's way more to it than that. I want to close off by just throwing a few thoughts your way in relation to Tauranga. And of course I don't live here and I don't claim to, to know everything about it. In fact, I probably know very little about it, but I do know I can, when I see potential, I can see it. And if Tauranga has enormous potential in this space. So there's that curve type again. And just that reminder, if you really want flora and fauna to persist in your urban environment, you're going to have to do something about the hollowing out of that curve. You're going to have to lift it somewhere and the question is where will you lift it? Well we've been doing some work already in some of your parks and reserves. This is just a little map, those yellow dots is where, where some of our monitoring plots are located. And man do we see potential in Tauranga. I mean when you think about what's actually happening in Tauranga already, Moao, what a gem. You know, just imagine if that could be developed to its full extent. What about Kopu Rerirua Valley? Man, is that the place to focus your activity? You have a corridor going from one end of the city all the way through and linking up to the estuary. It's a massive ecological corridor in waiting. And just by focusing on some of those existing bits and bringing them back to full health, you could be heading towards the 10% target. I, I could go on, I mean, I keep seeing good examples. And Johnson Reserve, I've had a bit of experience with in, uh, recently. Johnson Reserve is another gem. It comes from the headwater of the streams that run through there. And again, it comes right down to the coast and links to the estuary. Again, the potential for habitat reconstruction and looking after our flora and fauna is enormous there. So I guess what I'm doing to conclude is I'm posing the question to you in the audience, are we doing enough? 
Imagine Tauranga City in 2050. You have many of the key ingredients to achieve the 10% target over large chunks of your city. And I sincerely believed that cities, in fact, will be the place that will determine the fate of remaining biodiversity of our regions, of our nation, and the planet. So we're better to start because there will be no sustainable world without sustainable cities. Thank you very much. Bruce, thank you very much. If you'd like to remain there, I'd uh, open the floor to questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir, for a very interesting, informative, and indeed inspiring talk. However, um, several times you seem to equate exotic species with nuisance species. Mm. And I feel that's a very harsh, mm. well, a harsh generalisation anyway. Mm. I'm a bit of a fan of mm. northern European deciduous trees. Mm. And why can't we integrate them? Why does it all have to be the pristine New Zealand native forest? Mm. Can we have some exotics that yeah. aren't nuisance, please? Good question. But you said at one point in your, your question to me, why can't we have both? And of course the answer is we can. But boy, we can rebalance the situation because currently we have 97% of your habitat in Tauranga City dominated by things other than native. The call that I'm making tonight is about rebalancing our system. You know, this is a for another form of decolonization of New Zealand because what has happened here is that Europeans have come in, bought their flora and fauna with them, and ignored the treasure sitting in front of their eyes. The treasure of the 80% endemic plants and even higher levels of endemism amongst some of our animals in favour of something they bought with them. It is a value judgement, absolutely. But let me continue. I am also not against exotic species that do not cause a problem or are not a nuisance for our native habitat. But what about the flowering cherry? What about, you know, let me go on. What I'm saying is, let's rebalance the environment. Let's get it back to, and treasure the things that are our unique biological heritage, get the balance right, and also let's hammer species which are exotic and are invasive. Yes, when I'm doing habitat reconstructions, I sometimes use exotic species and transition them to indigenous dominance, but they are a tool for my use. They are not to stay on the landscape. Uh, I think the time is long gone in Aotearoa New Zealand, where we should be giving priority to exotic species over the things that are our indigenous biological heritage. awa. <laughs> He waka, waka rirangi toku waka no Hawaii awa aho mm -hmm. ko Anton toku ingwa um, Bruce, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, it's fascinating to see what, what you have done since uh, the early 19s when I was looking at the vegetation of, of the Hamilton, you might remember. I do remember yes. you. Yes, <laughs> of course, thank you. <laughs> it's fascinating that you have gone so far and see that the whole uh, ecosystem is incorporated. I mean, and I will be uh, lucky to live rural Taranga or of a ropey road and uh, with a lifestyle kiwi food orchard, mm -hmm. half a hectare kiwi food. So you know mm -hmm. how SESPRI will be happy about our production. Um, but we have the lucky that we live in a gully and I plant the, the flex, flexes and it's fascinating. And um, our neighbors are probably sim similar in vegetation and birds and things like that. So we now have also need 
lots of tui. Actually, I don't think they are breeding in trees mm -hmm. in the gully, but I'm not sure how, to, how less nests look like. Mm -hmm. So I fascinated to see the potentials because Oropi is not that far from Bauranga. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's probably for people who would know the area would say or Oropi is just uh, <laughs> should be part of the. Uh, Tauranga, but uh, I guess the Western Bay is trying to protect the residential settlement in that area that um, uh, water supply to Tauranga is protected. But I'm not sure whether I'm right in that sense. And the city people from the city council in Western Bay, they might know what, what the plans are for the next 20 years. But I I've, I've see really huge potential for getting us here off the ground and uh, do the right things for the whole um, <laughs> Tauranga mm -hmm. environment. And Is there a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how do you, get, how do you um, encourage these, these groups? Do, do you know in Tauranga and, uh, groups that you have organized in Hamilton, how you had organized that? Is that with the city council? Is that with the okay. uh, iwi? Ah, okay, yeah, so the answer then is how you're asking how we organised ourselves to achieve this. So essentially we got together, um, in the case of Waifakariki, we got together in the early 2000s when the first proposal was mooted and we formed a partnership. We formed a partnership with the City Council, the University of Waikato, Wintech, where the local hapu, uh, which was Ngāti Wairere, and we got together as a group and started the process. As we went along, we built more and more partners into the project. So Environment Waikato, as it was then, came on board quite quickly. That's our regional council. And progressively been growing it. We have a group known as the Friends of Waipakariki. That's a voluntary group that goes there every month and does a lot of the releasing of plants that have been planted. So we built in all of, the, all of the infrastructure, if you like, to make the project work. We also did a lot of work around um, authentication and verification of eco-sourcing nurseries. And of course, the Hamilton city itself, we managed to convince them to become focused on eco-sourcing. Now, that took a while too. But you know, the point here is, if you're going to do it, you've actually also got to do all of the planning and all of the relationship building and you know, building with your stakeholders and all of the agencies and bring them together with a collaborative approach. And only when you can do that can you survive because of course every three years the council changes, right? And sometimes you find that the current body of councillors aren't quite as sympathetic as the ones that went before. But you know what? The community is there forever. The iwi are there forever. It's a matter of getting them all together and mobilising and partnering and collaborating and getting the result that you seek by sheer persistence and doggedness. Ladies and gentlemen, just time probably for one more time is on our side over here, ma'am. Do you have anybody at Toya Homai that is as enthusiastic as you that we could get a group going in Tauranga? Because say we have got plenty of areas we can plant and who pays for the plants? Do you donate them as you go? Oh, right. Oh, God. Well, I'd say you've got a room full of people here tonight, actually. <laughs> I'm looking around about who's the volunteer, but... But actually, you've got, you've got all sorts of people who already exist, I know, because I've come across them in my travels here in Tauranga. I mean, look, I, I hesitate to name names, but I will. You've got a Loader Cup winner here and Rob McGowan. You've got another Loader Cup winner over here, Mark Dean. I mean, what else, you know, um, um, oh, you've got Richard Hart. I saw Richard Hart before. He's a fantastic expert in, in these things. There's people all through your community here in Tauranga who could actually get alongside the council and have a crack at some of us. Why not? Thank you, Bruce. Bruce is going to be here uh, afterwards, ladies and gentlemen, so if you'd like to come and ask him a question personally. Rob, would you just thank Bruce for us? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bruce, for presenting us with a vision and a challenge. 
And, and the, the last part that you said, yes, we have got the people here, and there's some amazing things happen. Did you know that the Kaimai Mamaku Forum was now up and roaring away again? Um, we've got about 50 care groups in our catchment around here. You know, what we have to do is work together. And that's the challenge and that's the vision. And that's what we're already doing, but let's build it up. You know, there's a Māori saying, uh, kia ora te, te whenua, kia ora te tangata. When the land is well, the people as well. We have social problems here. The way to in actual fact solve them is to care for our landscape, to heal it, make it well. That will make us well. Uh, the university's really building up here in Tauranga. We've got a wonderful man here in Tauranga, Chris Battersall. He's uh, heads the Coastal Research Institute. You see that big building going up there in town there on Gray Street? Um, we've got the expertise. We've got the people. Let's really, really go for it and make this place even more beautiful than it already is. Kia ora tātou.